Chapter Three Tick Tock of Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Tick Tock of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Chapter Three Magic Mystifies the Marchers. Princess Ozma was all unaware that the army of Oogaboo, led by their ambitious queen, was determined to conquer her kingdom. The beautiful girl ruler of Oz was busy with the welfare of her subjects and had no time to think of Anne so forth and her disloyal plans. But there was one who constantly guarded the peace and happiness of land of Oz and this was the official sorceress of the kingdom, Glinda the Good. In her magnificent castle, which stands far north of the Emerald City, where Ozma holds her court, Glinda owns a wonderful magic record book, in which is printed every event that takes place anywhere, just as soon as it happens. The smallest things and the biggest things are all recorded in this book. If a child stamps its foot in anger, Glinda reads about it. If a city burns down, Glinda finds the fact noted in her book. The sorceress always reads her record book every day, and so it was she knew that Anne Soforth, Queen of Oogaboo, had foolishly assembled an army of sixteen officers and one private soldier, with which she intended to invade and conquer the land of Oz. There was no danger but that Ozma, supported by the magic arts of Glinda the Good and the powerful wizard of Oz, both her firm friends, could easily defeat a far more imposing army than Anne's, but it would be a shame to have the peace of Oz interrupted by any sort of quarrelling or fighting. So Glinda did not even mention the matter to Ozma or to anyone else. She merely went into a great chamber of her castle, known as the Magic Room, where she performed a magical ceremony which caused the mountain path that led from Oogaboo to make several turns and twists. The result was that when Anne and her army came to the end of the pass, they were not in the land of Oz at all, but in an adjoining territory that was quite distinct from Ozma's domain and separated from Oz by an invisible barrier. As the Oogaboo people emerged into this country, the pass they had traversed disappeared behind them, and it was not likely they would ever find their way back into the valley of Oogaboo. They were greatly puzzled, indeed, by their surroundings and did not know which way to go. None of them had ever visited Oz, so it took them some time to discover they were not in Oz at all, but in an unknown country. Never mind, said Anne, trying to conceal her disappointment. We have started out to conquer the world, and here is part of it. In time, as we pursue our victorious journey, we will doubtless come to Oz, but until we get there, we may as well conquer whatever land we find ourselves in. Have we conquered this place, Your Majesty? anxiously inquired Major Cake. Most certainly, said Anne. We have met no people as yet, but when we do, we will inform them that they are our slaves, and afterward we will plunder them of all their possessions at a general apple. They may not possess anything, objected Private Files, but I hope they will fight us, just the same, a peaceful conquest wouldn't be any fun at all. Don't worry, said the Queen. We can fight, whether our foes do or not, 
and perhaps we would find it more comfortable to have the enemy surrender promptly. It was a barren country and not very pleasant to travel in. Moreover, there was little for them to eat, and as the officers became hungry, they became fretful. Many would have deserted had they been able to find their way home, but as the Oogaboo people were now hopelessly lost in a strange country, they considered it more safe to keep together than to separate. Queen Anne's temper, never very agreeable, became sharp and irritable, as she and her army tramped over the rocky roads without encountering either people or plunder. She scolded her officers until they became surly, and a few of them were disloyal enough to ask her to hold her tongue. Others began to reproach her for leading them into difficulties, and in the space of three unhappy days every man was mourning for his orchard in the pretty valley of Oogaboo. Files, however, proved a different sort. The more difficulties he encountered, the more cheerful he became, and the sighs of the officers were answered by the merry whistle of the private. His pleasant disposition did much to encourage Queen Anne, and before long she consulted the private soldier more often than she did his superiors. It was on the third day of their pilgrimage that they encountered their first adventure. Toward evening the sky was suddenly darkened and Major Nails exclaimed, A fog is coming toward us. I do not think it is a fog replied Files, looking with interest at the approaching cloud. It seems to me more like the breath of a rack. What is a rack? asked Anne, looking about fearfully. A terrible beast with a horrible appetite, answered the soldier, growing a little paler than usual. I have never seen a rack, to be sure, but I have read of them in the story books that grew in my orchard, and if this is indeed one of those fearful monsters, we are not likely to conquer the world. Hearing this, the officers became quite worried and gathered closer about their soldier. What is the thing like? asked one. The only picture of a rack that I ever saw in a book was rather blurred, said Files because the book was not quite right when it was picked. But the creature can fly in the air and run like a deer and swim like a fish. Inside its body is a glowing furnace of fire, and the rack breathes in air and breathes out smoke, which darkens the sky for miles around, wherever it goes. It is bigger than a hundred men and feeds on any living thing. The officers now began to groan and to tremble, but Files tried to cheer them, saying, It may not be a rack, after all, that we see approaching us, and you must not forget that we people of Oogaboo, which is part of the fairy land of Oz, cannot be killed. Nevertheless, said Captain Buttons, if the rack catches us and chews us up into small pieces, and swallows us, what will happen then? Then each small piece will still be alive, declared Files. I cannot see how that would help us, wailed Colonel Banjo. A hamburger steak is a hamburger steak, whether it is alive or not. I tell you, this may not be a rack, persisted Files. We will know when the cloud gets nearer whether it is the breath of a rack or not. If it has no smell at all, it is probably a fog, but if it has an odour of salt and pepper, it is a rack and we must prepare for a desperate fight. They all eyed the dark cloud fearfully. Before long it reached the frightened group and began to envelope them. Every nose sniffed the cloud, and every one detected in it the odour of salt and pepper. The rack, shouted Private Files, 
and with a howl of despair the sixteen officers fell to the ground, writhing and moaning in anguish. Queen Anne sat down upon a rock and faced the cloud more bravely, although her heart was beating fast. As for Files, he calmly loaded his gun and stood ready to fight the foe, as a soldier should. They were now in absolute darkness, for the cloud which covered the sky and the setting sun was black as ink. Then through the gloom appeared two round, glowing balls of red, and files at once decided these must be the monster's eyes. He raised his gun, took aim and fired. There were several bullets in the gun, all gathered from an excellent bullet tree in Oogaboo, and they were big and hard. They flew toward the monster and struck it, and with a wild, weird cry the rack came fluttering down, and its huge body fell plump upon the forms of the sixteen officers, who thereupon screamed louder than before. "'Badness me!' moaned the rack. "'See what you've done with that dangerous gun of yours.' "'I can't see,' replied Files, "'for the cloud formed by your breath darkens my sight.' "'Don't tell me it was an accident,' continued the rack, reproachfully, "'as it still flapped its wings in a helpless manner. "'Don't claim you didn't know the gun was loaded. "'I beg of you.' "'I don't intend to,' replied Files. Did the bullets hurt you very badly? One has broken my jaw, so that I can't open my mouth. You will notice that my voice sounds rather harsh and husky, because I have to talk with my teeth set close together. Another bullet broke my left wing, so that I can't fly, and still another broke my right leg, so that I can't walk. It was the most careless shot I ever heard of. Can't you manage to lift your body off from my commanding officers? inquired Files. From their cries, I'm afraid your great weight is crushing them. I hope it is, growled the rack. I want to crush them, if possible, for I have a bad disposition. If only I could open my mouth, I'd eat all of you although my appetite is poorly this warm weather. With this, the rack began to roll its immense body sideways, so as to crush the officers more easily, but in doing this it rolled completely off from them, and the entire sixteen scrambled to their feet and made off as fast as they could run. Private Files could not see them go, but he knew from the sound of their voices that they had escaped, so he ceased to worry about them. Pardon me if I now bid you good-bye, he said to the rack. The parting is caused by our desire to continue our journey. If you die, do not blame me, for I was obliged to shoot you as a matter of self-protection. I shall not die, answered the monster, for I bear a charmed life, but I beg you not to leave me. Why not? asked Files. Because my broken jaw will heal in about an hour, and then I shall be able to eat you. My wing will heal in a day, and my leg will heal in a week, when I shall be as well as ever. Having shot me, and so caused me all this annoyance, it is only fair and just that you remain here and allow me to eat you as soon as I can open my jaws. I beg to differ with you, returned the soldier firmly. I have made an engagement with Queen Anne of Oogaboo to help her conquer the world, and I cannot break my word for the sake of being eaten by a rack. Oh, that's different, said the monster. If you've an engagement, don't let me detain you. So Files felt around in the dark and grasped the hand of the trembling queen, whom he led away from the flapping, sighing rack. 
They stumbled over the stones for a way, but presently began to see dimly the path ahead of them. As soon as they got farther and farther away from the dreadful spot where the wounded monster lay, by and by they reached a little hill and could see the last rays of the sun flooding a pretty valley beyond for now they had passed beyond the cloudy breath of the rack. Here were huddled the sixteen officers, still frightened and panting from their run. They had halted only because it was impossible for them to run any farther. Queen Anne gave them a severe scolding for their cowardice, at the same time praising Files for his courage. We are wiser than he, however, muttered General Clock, for by running away we are now able to assist your majesty in conquering the world, whereas, had files been eaten by the rack, he would have deserted your army. After a brief rest they descended into the valley, and as soon as they were out of sight of the rack, the spirits of the entire party rose quickly. Just at dusk they came to a brook, on the banks of which Queen Anne commanded them to make camp for the night. Each officer carried in his pocket a tiny white tent. This, when placed upon the ground, quickly grew in size until it was large enough to permit the owner to enter it and sleep within its canvas walls. Files was obliged to carry a knapsack, in which was not only his own tent, but an elaborate pavilion for Queen Anne, besides a bed and chair and a magic table. This table, when set upon the ground in Anne's pavilion, became of large size, and in a drawer of the table was contained the Queen's supply of extra clothing, her manicure and toilet articles, and other necessary things. The royal bed was the only one in the camp, the officers and privates sleeping in hammocks attached to their tent poles. There was also in the knapsack a flag bearing the royal emblem of Oogaboo, and this flag files flew upon its staff every night to show that the country they were in had been conquered by the Queen of Oogaboo. So far, no one but themselves had seen the flag, but Anne was pleased to see it flutter in the breeze, and considered herself already a famous conqueror. End of chapter 3